Our next sponsor is Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters with great sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. Podcorn takes out the middleman so podcasters of all levels have a chance to monetize their podcasts, setting their own rates and having full control over their collaborations. We started using Podcorn a few months ago and it's already changed the game. We can actually make some money from podcasting, which means we can put more time into doing what we love and trying to produce quality content. I found the site so easy to use, podcorn.com. You'll find the link in our show notes. It really is easy to navigate and you can view loads of different sponsorship opportunities right there on your screen. It couldn't be easier to pitch a proposal to a brand to work with them on a campaign. Podcorn makes sure podcasters are able to keep their creative freedom and have full control over how and when we monetize. They also have automated payment, which means you get your money as soon as you've submitted your work. If you're a fellow podcast host, definitely check out their site, podcorn.com. He has 102 separate knife wounds uh, on his body. This year received a total of 16 stab injuries, and two of those alone would have proved fatal. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. Welcome to Crime Labs. I am Eileen. And I'm Charlie. There is an argument to be made as to whether you can recognise psychopathic tendencies in children before their personalities have fully developed. John Ronson wrote, quote, The 1959 Mental Health Act for England and Wales describes psychopaths simply as having a persistent disorder or disability of mind which results in abnormally aggressive or seriously irresponsible conduct on the part of the patient and requires or is susceptible to medical treatment. The consensus from the beginning was that only 1% of humans had it, but the chaos they caused was so far-reaching it could actually remould society, remould it all wrong like when someone breaks their foot and it's cast badly and the bones stick out in odd directions, unquote. Located in the southeast of England, 50 miles northeast of London, is the historic market town of Colchester. In March 2014, a brutal murder sparked community-wide panic. People feared walking alone. The most vulnerable wore personal panic alarms and the police tried to track the perpetrator of one of the most sadistic crimes the county had ever seen. The killer intended to commit multiple murders, but no one could have predicted who was responsible. This is Hear No Evil. At around 1am on the night of Saturday 29th of March 2014, someone walking through Castle Park came across a man lying on the grass. Heavily intoxicated and sleeping off the effects of a night of drinking at a local pub, The witness asked the man if he was all right, and the man replied yes. The good Samaritan said, quote, you want to be careful, mate, unquote, before he walked on, leaving the man to go back to sleep. The next morning at around 6am, the man was found with severe upper body injuries in Riverside Walk near Lower Castle Park by a member of the public. Paramedics rushed to the scene, but the victim could not be saved. The police cordoned off a 1.5 mile stretch between Wakefield Close and Riverside Place in Castle Park and urged the public to be on the lookout as the killer had not yet been identified. Superintendent Steve Ditchburn said that the increased police presence in Colchester Town Centre was to reassure residents and assist with the investigation. He said, quote, We remain concerned that we have not yet been able to trace the person or people responsible for this death. I hope residents will take some reassurance from the increased presence today, which will be continuing throughout the evening and as long as is necessary. But I am aware that this incident will be causing some to worry. I would ask people to remain vigilant and to contact us if they see anything suspicious. The victim was identified as James Atfield, a 33-year-old local man who'd been living in semi-sheltered accommodation following a severe brain injury four years earlier. His mother, Julie, released a statement following her son's death that read, quote, James was known as Jim to his family and was always shy and polite. Over the years, people commented on how good his manners were. He loved karaoke and would often visit local Colchester bars to take part. He also enjoyed playing darts and watching stand-up comedy. Four years ago, Jim was involved in a car accident which left him with a brain injury and caused the left side of his body to be weak. 
the injury affected his reasoning and speech. Jim had always preferred going for a drink in a quiet old man's pub, rather than clubbing, and never had many friends his own age. After the accident, he was vulnerable and did not like going to crowded places as he knew he needed to keep away from trouble to avoid any risks which could lead to further injury. Unquote. After his accident, Jim had spent eight weeks in a coma. He pulled through but had a long road of rehabilitation ahead of him. His family said that even after the accident, he was always smiling and striving to be, quote, the best he could be, unquote. On the night before he was found, he'd been drinking in the River Lodge pub a short distance away from where he was found. The following day, around midday, two female officers turned up at the address of Julie Finch, the mother of Jim Atfield. After hearing the news, Julie recalled letting out a blood-curdling scream, which is all she remembers of receiving the news that her son had been killed. Julie was allowed to visit Jim the following day, and on Mother's Day 2014, Julie said a final farewell to her son. The senior investigating officer, DCI Simon Werrett, said, quote, Castle Park is used at all hours of the day and night, and I'm sure someone will have seen something. I really need to hear from anyone who saw anybody acting suspiciously in the park, anyone who heard anything untoward, or anyone who thinks they may know who is responsible for Jim's death. Equally, I would invite the person or people responsible to hand themselves in. We've not yet been able to establish a motive for this violent attack during which we believe a bladed weapon has been used. Until the post-mortem examination has been carried out, I am unable to say what that weapon may have been or to elaborate on the injuries caused. Unquote. A press conference was held on March 31st where investigators detailed the injuries Jim received to his face, neck, hands and back. Someone wrote Detective uh, Chief Inspector leaving the, the murder inquiry into the death of James uh, Atfield. And we've conducted a post-mortem now, which lasted eight and a half hours uh, on Sunday. He has 102 separate knife wounds uh, on his body. And we are appealing to the public for information in relation to this uh, event. Uh, if there's anyone out there who knows anything about it, if someone came home with blood on their clothing, if someone came home um, with uh, injuries they didn't go out with, if someone's got a knife missing from their knife block, then we'd urge you to contact us. Or if anyone has any information at all who can identify who was responsible for this, then we'd urge the public to contact us. Carl O'Malley, I'm the Chief Superintendent responsible for policing in the north of the county, which includes Colchester. And we have uh, responded to this horrific attack. We have reassured the public by raising the levels of patrolling that we do around both Colchester Town Centre and around the Castle Park area and the surrounding estates. You will see more police community officers and more regular police officers patrolling. Um, if you have any information at all, as DCI where it says, if you don't want to ring, then speak to one of those officers and pass that information to them and they will make sure that that reaches the inquiry team. So we will continue to offer higher levels of policing uh, out there in Colchester to reassure members of the public. Jim sustained 102 stab wounds, many to his head, several centimetres deep. He was also stabbed through the left eye and numerous times below his right ear, which severed his jugular vein. There were many defensive wounds to his arms and hands, indicating that he had tried to fend off his attacker. It was a frenzied, brutal attack. Some of the injuries were superficial, just the tip of the knife had penetrated the skin which indicated the killer had used controlled deliberate motions to take Jim's life. Numerous arrests were made but the police could not connect the murder to anybody. By mid-April, a substantial reward was offered to anybody with information that would lead to Jim's killer, but the lead did not turn up any information. Jim's mother Julie appealed to the public for information. Jim was... Jim was really likeable. Nobody had a bad word to say about Jim. After his accident, he sort of was a bit of a loner and he went out on his own most of the time, but he was always polite to people and anyone you speak to would say that he was just a nice, genuine guy. He was very caring. He sort of tended to look after people a lot. He just didn't know anyone. He, w he wouldn't have argued with anyone or started on anyone. He just sort of liked his karaoke and going out and having a quiet drink and he never 
could drink too much because of his injury, because he had the balance issues after his accident. He was just happy to go out, do his karaoke and go home. He was just, you know, he, w he wouldn't have provoked anything or he, he was just so vulnerable and he was aware how vulnerable he was, so. <sighs> Julie, what would you ask the public to do? Well, I'd ask them to think back to Friday, whether they were in town in Colchester on Friday or if they know anyone that was. Just if they saw Jim or know anything about where he went or what he did, just just to come forward and let let the police know, because somebody knows something. <laughs> Jim was a vulnerable person and hadn't been able to defend himself at the time, let alone provoke anyone to commit such a heinous crime. The people of Colchester retreated in fear. A killer lived among them, and it was only a matter of time before they struck again. Approximately 3,000 personal attack alarms were distributed to people who felt unsafe in their own community. Despite the increased police presence, another attack was carried out, this time in broad daylight. We'd like to tell you about our sponsor for this episode, Best Fiends. We love it because it's the perfect break from our true crime research. I find it still manages to challenge my brain because it's a puzzle game, but it's a casual game, so it doesn't stress me out, which is perfect these days. We can even challenge each other. We can't fly to visit each other at the minute, so this is the perfect game to play to keep us connected. There are also new in-game challenges and events every month, so the game always feels fresh and you'll never be bored. You can even play the game without using Wi-Fi. I created a whole new world right on my phone. I just unlocked Napoleon and love that he wears a cute little thimble as his crown and holds the matchstick as his scepter. Plus, I love his area bomb power. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5 star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the or. Best Fiends. Just before 10.40am on June 17, 2014, police were called to a pathway in Greenstead, Colchester. A young woman was found with serious injuries to her head and chest in an alleyway just off a housing estate, Avon Way. A man out looking for his cat spotted her on the pathway and went with a friend to investigate. He was met with a horrifying scene. The woman's face was destroyed, her eye was hanging from her socket. Paramedics attempted to save the young woman, but she died at the scene. Senior Investigating Officer DCI Hall said, quote, We are carrying out house-to-house -house inquiries and are searching the area using the police helicopter and dog teams. I would ask anyone with any information about what happened to contact Essex Police, unquote. It's about 10.40 this morning that we got a call from a member of the public um, that a woman was uh, on the pavement lying on the back uh, path uh, in Colchester, not far off Avon Way. She has some uh, uh, massive injuries to her head and uh, wounds to her body. And um, whilst paramedics called and attended and uh, attempted to save her life, unfortunately she died. The victim was identified as Nahid Almania, a 31-year-old Saudi Arabian student. She had been walking along the Salary Brook Trail to get to college. Nahid had been dressed in traditional Islamic clothing. Her head was covered with a multicoloured hijab and she was wearing sunglasses. It was initially thought to be a hate crime as Miss Almania was easily identified as a Muslim woman by her clothes. But DCI Steve Warren admitted, quote, There is a possibility that it's a serial killer, unquote. Our current investigation is focused around the murder of Nahid Almania. Nahida was a young lady from Saudi Arabia who was studying here in the UK, living in Woodrow Way here in Colchester and studying at Essex University. The picture that we've built up of her is a, a young, very intelligent individual who was pursuing her PhD studies and working incredibly hard to further those studies. We know that she left her home address and she went to the area of Hunswick Road and to the shop and past the shops there, the parade of shops, around 10.20 on Tuesday morning. At 10.40am we received calls from members of the public to say that Nahid's body had been discovered very close to where we are now here on the Salary Brook Trail within the Greenstead Estate. Unfortunately, as a result of the injuries that Nahid had suffered, uh, she died here and was pronounced dead by paramedics 
uh, here on the Salary Brook trial. Following a post-mortem, we've established that she received a total of 16 stab injuries, and two of those alone would have proved fatal. Our inquiry is now specifically focused around searching the area of the Salary Brook trial, conducting forensic examinations and also extensive house-to-house -house inquiries, with a large number of officers deployed here in Colchester to provide reassurance to the community and also to give them an opportunity to talk to us. I'd ask anybody who was in the area of Hunswick Road at 10.20am or thereabouts to come forward and speak to us. We know from the CCTV footage there that there were people in that area in that time and they are yet to come forward to us and speak to us. Those individuals can speak to us on 01245 282 103. In addition to that, I'd ask everybody who lives on the Green City Estate to think about searching their gardens, their bins and any outbuildings. We're specifically looking for any items that have been discarded there, whether it be bloodstained clothing, whether it be weapons or anything else that's been left behind. If it has, then please contact us. We're keen to seize those items and to deal with those items appropriately. Finally, I'd say we're absolutely certain that the answer to this truly terrible crime lies here within the Colchester community. It's a vibrant community, it's a strong community, and together, working with the community, we're certain that we can find the person or people responsible and bring them to justice. We recognise that clearly there must be some concerns within the community with the murder of James Atfield back in March of this year. We continue to investigate that offence as well, and we've got staff dedicated to both investigations. At the moment, they're parallel but separate investigations, and we will continue to review whether or not they should be a linked investigation. But as I say, at this time they remain separate but parallel investigations. Nahid al was short and slight. She was making her way to college when someone approached her from behind and stabbed her in the lower back, puncturing her liver. The attacker then ripped off her sunglasses and stabbed her in the eye. When she fell to the floor, she fractured her skull. The attack continued. She was also stabbed in her other eye and in the left of her chest, with such force that it fractured her rib. Again, there were eight superficial stab wounds that would have taken a significant amount of control to inflict. A statement from Nahid's family was read by a family liaison officer. The family had been left devastated by the terrible murder of Nahid. Nahid was a remarkable and gentle person who was loved for her kind and caring nature. Publicly, Nahid was a quiet and dignified lady who chose to pursue her academic studies in order to work towards her PhD. And whilst in England, she made a decision that she would respect her heritage and traditions in the way that she dressed and conducted herself. However, when she was with her family, Nahid was a warm and loving person who enjoyed laughter and the company of her parents, siblings and extended family. The amount of people that attended Nahid's funeral is a tribute to how much she was cared for and respected. As a family, we have been upset by the media speculation about Nahid's death, in particular the publishing of a photograph claiming to be Nahid, which is not her. We wish to appeal directly to the person responsible for Nahid's death to come forward and hand themselves in to the police in order to relieve our suffering and let justice take its course. It is vital that anyone with any information about Nahid's death, no matter how small, contacts the police to share that information. We respectfully ask that we are left alone to grieve in private as we continue to work with the police in England and Saudi Arabia to investigate this brutal crime. The police noted the similarities between the killings and ran the two investigations side by side. Both victims had been stabbed in the eyes an injury that would cause the casualty to scream out in pain. The attacks appeared completely random, which continued the hysteria in Colchester. The community were terrified. Police were called in from neighbouring communities to help with the search for the killer. There are clearly some similarities with two knife attacks within a three-month period within Colchester, but there are also some distinct differences between the two crimes, and we're working towards those. While the investigation was ongoing, the killer was still nowhere to be found. Months went by and in November 2014, DCI Hall provided an update of the investigation into Nahid al murder and asked for the public to view CCTV footage to help with their inquiries. 
Well, we're back here this morning on the Stanley Brook Trail, some four months plus after Nahid's brutal and tragic murder. This has been a huge investigation for Essex Police and for the Kent and Essex Serious Crime Directorate, and it continues to be a priority. There is still a major crime team dedicated to the investigation. We've taken over 1,300 statements, spoken to over 950 witnesses. There are now 4,500 exhibits uh, in the system, and we continue to work our way through over 150,000 hours of CCTV. Uh, despite all that work, there is still no clear motive for Nahid's murder. Um, regardless of why she was killed, um, I believe that the people that were responsible for her death, the personal people that were responsible for her death, must have been seen in and around the Salary Brook Trail uh, on the morning of the 17th of June. And so today we've released a number of images taken from CCTV cameras around the area uh, which show people who are potential witnesses who would have been in the area on the morning. And I'm appealing to those uh, members of the public, students, people that perhaps live and work in the area to look at the Essex Police website, essex.police.uk, see if they can recognise themselves or perhaps recognise somebody they know and make contact uh, with the investigation. It's vitally important to me that I trace as many people that were in the area at the time, try and build up a picture of exactly who was here, who was moving around. It may be that people don't recognise the significance of something that they've seen, a vehicle or a person that was in the area. Uh, and that's why um, we're asking again this morning for the, the public to help, uh, the local people of Colchester to help look at the website. Um, and if you recognise somebody, please make contact with us. Almost a year went by. There were investigations ongoing, appeals made by Jim Atfield's mother Julie for both her son and Nahid, as Nahid's family lived in Saudi Arabia. Local and national press covered the murders and Colchester residents lived in fear for months. Neighbours remember being too scared to go out for fear of falling victim to a malicious murder near their own homes. A year after Jim Atfield's horrific murder, his mother Julie made an appeal with Essex police for information leading to his killer. You always get gossip when anything happens, especially in a, a community such as Colchester. You get gossip, you get people talking, oh, I heard this, I heard that. So if anybody's heard anything, even if they think, oh, load of rubbish, still come forward and say, because, you know, sometimes at the root of all that gossip, there is actually truth there. James's family are desperately trying to rebuild their lives, but they want answers as to why he lost his life in such tragic circumstances. If you know anything at all, then please contact us. Crime Stoppers continue to offer a £10,000 reward for information that leads to conviction for the person or the people responsible for murdering James. On the 26th of May 2015, whilst walking her dog through Salary Brook, where Nahid had been killed less than a year before, Michelle Sadler saw a suspicious-looking figure standing on a footbridge. The person was dressed in a safari-style jacket that she recognised as being worn by a person of interest in the murders. The man was wearing dark, thick-rimmed glasses... He jumped out of a bush, crossed the path in front of Michelle, then hid on the opposite side of the path behind trees. Michelle was uneasy and turned back. There she met another woman she knew and they went back to the spot and found that the person was standing beneath a tree. They were frightened enough to call the police who arrived in minutes. Here is what was said on the call. Essex Police Control Room. Hi. I wonder if you can help me. I'm actually on the salary brook. Um the Long Ridge end of the trail where that murder was last year and there's a very suspicious guy down there who's just standing there and it's like obviously a dog trail and he's just on his own and it's quite a secluded area. Um, I don't think there's anyone around to have a look and he's got like a, I don't know, I could be wrong, but he's got a jacket that looks similar to what was all over the paper and everything and it's on the same trail as what happened um, almost a year ago. Okay. Yeah. What's suspicious about him? Well, to be honest with you, he's on a bridge, not a footpath. He was stood behind some of the trees and it's obviously... It's only a dog walking place. And I first went down on my own with my dog and I saw him sort of hiding and it made me freeze thinking he would come out. Is he in a bush, did you say? Sort of hiding? No, he's practically hiding. He's on a bridge, just practically... Yeah, he's in a secluded area. He's, he's not in the main bit. And then I've come out with one of the other ladies that's got a big dog and we've walked down there and he's a little bit further into the bushes, a 
little bit and it's just not the sort of person you'd expect to see. When the police arrived, they found James Fairweather, a 16-year-old dressed in a safari jacket. His dark glasses framed his thin face. He was wearing surgical gloves. In his pocket, he had a lock knife. When the police asked him what he was doing, he told them he was looking for his next victim. Fairweather was taken to the police station where he had no issue speaking freely. The police had made inquiries with the team before because he'd been arrested for a knife offence previously, but they had no idea he was the killer that had terrified Colchester for over a year. James Fairweather said that he was responsible for the murders of Jim Atfield and Nahid Almania. He explained in great detail how he carried out each of the murders, asking for permission to stand to fully reenact the way he drove his knife into their bodies over and over, and how he stood over them. He described how he would return to the scene of each crime just to feel the feelings he felt all over again, to repeat the spine-chilling screams that his victims let out as he borrowed his knife through their eyeballs. Look, some of the voices were talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice, or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. And I saw him. It was where it was laying on the grass. <laughs> Like that, it was like, like this place, just fast asleep, swear he was drunk. Then he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. So I went up to him. Can I stand up? I, yes. Went up to him. Stood over like that. Not that. I stabbed him first there. And I done it a few times. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. He claimed that as he stabbed his victims, the voices were laughing louder and louder inside his head. He told the detectives that the attack lasted, quote, about two to three minutes, unquote. He spoke about the rage he went into, quote, when you're in a rage and hearing voices laughing, you get really good strength and really fast, unquote. Fairweather described how he used a boyonet to stab Nahid Amania after the voices in his head instructed him to. He claimed they said that, quote, they needed another sacrifice to give them inner peace because they had committed sins, unquote. He described how he stabbed Nahid in the lower back before spinning her around and ripping off her glasses. He stabbed her in the eye and he said, quote, it killed her instantly because I went through the brain, unquote. The police asked him how he felt about the attacks, and he simply replied, quote, A bit sad. It was the right thing to do, because the voices were telling me to do it for them to get inner peace. A bit sad, and the right thing to do. A mixture together. The victims feel peaceful. I don't. Unquote. When speaking about being arrested, Fairweather said, quote, Where I was arrested, people walk their dogs. That was going to be my third victim. There was no one about. I didn't see the woman who called the police. Then they arrested me. Unquote. The following day, he was brought to Chelmsford Magistrate Court to be charged with the murders. James Fairweather walked into the court wearing a grey tracksuit. He smiled at his parents as he was brought to the dock. His parents struggled to hold back tears as the charges were read, but James Fairweather seemed relaxed speaking only to confirm his name, date of birth, and that he understood the charges brought against him. Two counts of murder and one count of possession of an offensive weapon, the lock knife he was arrested with. During the investigation into the murders, 70 Essex residents were called for questioning, all people who had recently been charged for knife crimes in the area, and one of those people was 15-year-old James Fairweather, who had, just five months before, held up a local convenience store with a knife. James stated he was home on the morning of Nahid's murder. He was subsequently dismissed from the investigation, but he was not forgotten. There had been no evidence at this time to indicate that the 15-year-old lad could be capable of such a monstrous act. Three days before Jim Atfield was stabbed 102 times in a random, frenzied, unprovoked attack in Castle Park, James Fairweather had appeared in youth court on referral order for the offence of knife point robbery. Fairweather managed to convince the magistrates not to detain him, and so he walked free, just to brutally murder a vulnerable man. James Fairweather was born on the 5th of August 1998. He had an unremarkable childhood, being described as a quote, quiet and well-behaved child, sensitive to the needs of others, unquote. But something changed early in his secondary school experience. 
He was described as being intense and detached. From as young as 11 years old, he was described as a thug by a teacher. He had been bullied and so developed a need to comply with other students. If a student had told him to go and punch another, he would, without question or remorse, simply for the high five that he might have gotten in return. He was beyond control when at school. He was recurrently violent with other teenagers, punching, kicking and headbutting them, resulting in regular exclusion from school and classes. He was bullied for the size of his ears and he claimed this was when he began hearing voices, although he never mentioned them until after his arrest. The girls at school weren't exempt from Fairweather's behaviour. He would later admit that he wanted to rape the girls at school that tormented or rejected him. He immersed himself in horror movies, video games and violent pornography. Fairweather had a desperate obsession with serial killers, his favourite being the Yorkshire Ripper or Ted Bundy. He was blurring the lines between the ferocity of the material he was absorbed in at home and his life at school. His peers claimed he threatened to accomplish a Columbine-style gun massacre in his school. In January 2014, James Fairweather would get his first taste of crime. Wearing his Colchester Academy uniform, he held up a local convenience store. The store, Martin's newsagents, was on the Green Sit estate. He walked in carrying a knife and stole cigars and a lighter. This was a completely arbitrary act because James didn't even smoke. James would later claim that this was a quote, warm-up, unquote. James then had his first experience of the criminal justice system. He appeared in the youth court for the knife point robbery. He was not detained or incarcerated because he claimed he did not recollect the robbery. He was given a referral order. This brush with the law did not result in urgency to change from James's perspective. Just three days later, he would go on to kill Jim Atfield. His behaviour at school resulted in his exclusion from Colchester Academy. He was only allowed to return to sit his GCSE exams. After his arrest in May 2015, the police searched his home and found a knife hidden in his school blazer, along with a latex glove. Just two weeks after his arrest and subsequent confession, Fairweather changed his mind. He claimed the voices in his head had urged him to confess and he had in fact not committed the murders. In August 2015, while remanded in custody for the murders of Jim Atfield and Nahid al Fairweather met with Dr Simon Hill, a consultant psychiatrist. Dr Hill recalled his first meeting with the teenager. Quote, My impression was he was describing the most antisocial thoughts I have come across. There was real excitement about violence. He talked about voices telling him to set fire to babies, cutting their necks off. He talked with real anger about prostitutes and his hatred of them, and how he would like to pull their tongues out. The voices were telling him to do this. I remember in particular talking about how his head teacher had made him angry, and he was really unable to contain his excitement at the thought of harming the head teacher, throwing acid on him. He was worried about being left with children as he worried about killing them. I was very struck by his excitement about violence, and it struck me as very unusual. This man was extremely risky. Unquote. James Fairweather had spoken openly about his interest in serial killers and his desire to join a neo Nazi group. The initial diagnosis was personality disorder or possible psychosis, but the final diagnosis was psychosis. Dr. Hill suspected Fairweather was autistic. Dr. Hill spoke about Fairweather's obsession with serial killers and said it likely had an impact on the offences he committed. Quote, the voices are not coming from nowhere, they are coming from his brain, and if what is going into his brain is about serial killers, it is not surprising to me that the voices talk about that. Unquote. From the day of his arrest, Fairweather remained in custody, and in January 2016, just three months prior to the trial, a 1 in 11,000 DNA match was found between Fairweather and Nahid al which caused Fairweather to change his mind once more. He admitted two counts of manslaughter by diminished responsibility during a hearing at the Old Bailey. The Crown Prosecution Service did not accept the plea and a murder trial was scheduled for April 2016 at Guildford Crown Court. The High Court Judge, Mr Justice Robin Spencer QC, was overseeing the case. The jury was set the task of determining whether a recognised medical disorder had impaired the mental function of James Fairweather to the extent that he was not responsible for his actions. They had to decide whether he had an understanding of what he was doing, controlling his actions and making a rational judgement over these actions. 
Philip Bennett's QC headed up the prosecution. It was the prosecution's argument that Fairweather was accountable for the murders because he had prepared for them and took steps to cover his tracks afterwards. Simon Spence QC for the defence said that while James Fairweather committed the murders and knew what he was doing, he did not have the ability to make a rational judgement or control his actions because he was under the control of the voices in his head. The jury had to consider why a psychologist Fairweather had been seeing around the time of the murders did not see any evidence of psychosis or any mental disorders, how Fairweather was able to resist commands to self-harm but not to kill others, and why he confessed immediately after his arrest despite covering his tracks up until that point. The psychiatrist who had been seeing the teenager in January 2014 noted that he was, quote, emotionally detached, unquote and, quote, socially insensitive, unquote. There were no concerns of autism or any other disorders. They concluded that Fairweather's behaviour was similar to that of all men in his family. James's father had allegedly had anger issues as a teen and also heard voices, but these issues subsided as he reached adulthood. James Fairweather seemed unbothered by the proceedings, gesturing two thumbs up and mouthing the words, quote, chin up, unquote, to his father who was silent in the gallery. During the trial, James's cold demeanour didn't go unnoticed by the jury, but it divided opinion in the courtroom. Did he hold no feeling of remorse for what he had done, or was he simply incapable of caring? The jury listened as they heard how Fairweather had calmly covered his tracks following his murder of Jim. He had taken his knife home and washed it, then disposed of it in a fast-flowing stream. His blood-stained clothes were left in a black bag to be collected with the household rubbish. He had snuck out of his home through the living room window on the night he killed Mr Atfield, careful not to wake his parents who were sleeping upstairs. A statement was read by the prosecutor, written by the first officer that arrived at the scene of Jim Atfield's murder. It said that he believed that the victim had been scalped. He applied pressure to the wounds as other officers attempted CPR until paramedics arrived. Forensic pathologist Dr Nicholas Hunt testified about the nature of Jim Atfield's injuries detailing the 102 stab wounds he received to areas including his eye, head, back, hands and forehead. A female cyclist had been the one to discover Mr Atfield's body just before 6am on March 29th, 2014. A statement from the man who discovered Nahid Awaniya's body on the Salary Brook Trail three months later was also read to the court. The man assumed she had a heart attack, but as he got closer he could hear her gurgling and he tried to reassure her by saying, quote, Don't worry, we're getting you an ambulance. You'll be all right. Unquote. But when he saw the paramedic lay down his bag, he knew that she had died. He said, quote, I could not comprehend what I had just seen. I couldn't believe it. It was terrifying. I felt sick. Unquote. Dr Nathaniel Carey carried out the post-mortem on Miss Almania. It was his opinion that the initial wounds would have required, quote, severe force, unquote but later cuts seemed, quote, targeted and controlled, unquote. Fairweather had used a bayonet to carry out the attack, then dumped the knife in a fast-flowing stream and left his blood-soaked clothes in a bin bag to be collected, just like he had done with the evidence from Jim Atfield's murder. The jury was showing the footage from James Fairweather's police interviews. They saw him detailing how he killed the victims in great detail. He said that Miss Almania should not have been walking alone, saying, quote, she should have known there was a murderer in town, unquote. There were three psychiatrists called by the defence to testify to prove that it was likely that Fairweather did have diminished responsibility. Dr Simon Hill, Dr Peter Mish and Dr David Ho. They stated that the killings were prompted by a, quote, grave combination, unquote, of psychosis and autism. They said the claims were substantiated by James Fairweather's childhood development, hallucinations he experienced even while incarcerated, and his subsequent response to antipsychotic medications he had been prescribed. They claimed this responsibility was, quote, substantially impaired, unquote, by these factors. A consultant psychiatrist was brought in by the prosecution. Dr. Joseph Phillips said, quote, It is significant that he has not mentioned the voices until he is arrested, and then there is a torrent of voices. They are a fallback position if arrested. In my view, it's inconceivable that voices would have been happening and a boy hid it from people around him. It is inevitable that they would have been picked up and observed. 
I think he is doing that to distance himself from what he has done. Maybe over the years he heard his internal thoughts. We can all have that experience of audible thoughts. That is not psychosis, unquote. Dr. Joseph said that such severe auditory hallucinations would have been impossible to keep concealed for a teenage boy and someone would have noticed. Fairweather had told experts that the voices had begun in January 2013 and increased in intensity. He said he was, quote, keeping his head down, unquote, after killing Nahid al because the police were everywhere and no one was walking alone anymore. After being arrested, he said that the voices told him he needed to confess as punishment for not killing anyone else. While in custody, the voices continued to tell him to kill, even willing him to stab an officer who was bringing him food. He was able to resist this command. Dr. Joseph dismissed Fairweather's claims of hallucinations as unconvincing, stating that the examples of seeing a little girl in his cell and a hand coming out of the TV were cliched and did not fit with a diagnosis of psychosis. He said that the teen's response to antipsychotic medication was not evidence that proved he had been psychotic, it only proved that the medication had a calming effect. Fairweather had said that the medication regime made him feel as though he, quote, did not think he was dangerous at all and could be let out tomorrow, unquote. Furthermore, the psychiatrist disputed the claim that Fairweather may have forgotten about the incidents because they were too traumatic. He said that this would have happened after the killing, not over a year later. Fairweather had told experts that he had gone to Castle Park numerous times after he killed Jim Atfield because he wanted to, quote, be near where what the devil did, unquote. Dr. Joseph said that this could have given Fairweather gratification. Fairweather also stated that he didn't go on to study carpentry because he didn't feel like it was safe to have access to tools. Dr. Joseph had assessed James Fairweather as having emerging personality disorder. Under cross-examination by the defence, he conceded that if it were severe enough, it could diminish the defendant's responsibility. He had said Fairweather showed emerging features of psychopathy, but due to his age, he could not be formally diagnosed as a psychopath. The jury consisted of five male and seven female jurors. After two weeks of trial, they deliberated for eight hours and 33 minutes before returning their verdict. As it was read aloud to the court, two mothers broke down in tears for their sons. James Fairweather's mother cried as he was found guilty on all counts, and Jim Atfield's mother cried as she got justice. Mr Justice Spencer QC described it as a quote, harrowing case and thanked the jury for their efforts before exempting them from jury service for four years. The public, the families of the victims and James Fairweather's parents were praised for the dignity they constructed themselves with as the verdicts were read. Outside the court, Chief Constable Steve Warren said, quote, These were horrific crimes where two people lost their lives in tragic circumstances. Fairweather admitted killing James and Nahid but denied their murder was calculated and pre-planned. He then forced their family to endure the pain and grief of a trial rather than admitting that he had murdered them. Today's verdict will never heal the pain of losing their loved ones in such horrific circumstances. Hopefully they now have some answers and can be reassured that their killer will face a long time behind bars. This was one of the biggest investigations carried out by Essex Police. My team worked tirelessly for months to gather even the smallest pieces of information that could lead us towards finding the person responsible for these crimes. I would like to thank them personally for their commitment. I would also like to thank the families of James and Nahid, who helped and supported us during this investigation, and the community of Colchester, who were fully behind our efforts to bring their killer to justice." Unquote. The investigation had cost over £2.6 million. There was a massive increase in police presence in Colchester, as well as the cost of distributing the panic alarms. It had taken two years for justice to be served, and Steve Warren summarised the case in a publication released by Essex Police. Since 2014, I've been overseeing the investigation that followed the killings of Jim Atfield and Nahid al in Colchester. These were two brutal offences that sent shockwaves through the local community. Jim was killed on the Riverside Path in Colchester on the 29th of March 2014. He received in excess of 100 stab wounds to his body during that attack. Jim was a, a young man who was seeking to rebuild his life, having been injured in a road traffic collision some years previously, and his family had been left devastated by his loss. Nahid was a guest in our country, studying at the University of Essex, and she was killed on the Salary Brook trial on the 17th of June 2014. Again, she received multiple stab wounds to her head and to her body. Following Nahid's murder, two separate but parallel inquiries were launched 
over 1,500 police officers and 180 police staff worked on those inquiries in the search for a truth. There were significant searches in parks, waterways and open public spaces and we received absolutely fantastic support from the local community. But we begin with the story of 33-year-old James Atfield. The father of five... There were two Crime Watch appeals and the local and national media provided significant assistance to the investigations by keeping the inquiry in the public mind. I'm incredibly grateful to the local community for all of their support, the commitment and resolve that they showed. The staff and officers that were engaged on the inquiry spoke continuously about the warm welcome that they received from the local community, whether it be from information being provided that positively assisted the investigation or from simple gestures such as cups of tea and refreshments being offered during long working hours. In May of last year, we received a call from a member of the public who described seeing a young man in suspicious circumstances close to the area where Nahid had been killed. As a result of that, we've seen a young man convicted today of the killings of Nahid and James. It's incredibly important that the community recognise the fantastic way in which they responded. The local community, the staff and students at the University of Essex, local businesses and those wider partner agencies that we work with. I'm incredibly grateful to them for all of their support throughout what has been a very long and difficult inquiry. But as a result, today a young man has been convicted of killing James and Nahid and as a result the local community are safer than they were before. A hearing was held at the Old Bailey in London on April 29th, 2016. James Fairweather was dressed in a leather coat while awaiting to be sentenced for the murders of Jim Atfield and Nahid Almania. Fairweather had been found guilty by a unanimous jury decision a week earlier. Usually the minimum sentence for someone under the age of 18 who has committed murder is 12 years. In his sentencing remarks, Justice Spencer said the following, quote, I have to sentence you for two brutal and sadistic murders committed when you were only 15 years old. You are now 17. Your 18th birthday is in three months' time on the 5th of August. For murder, there is only one sentence prescribed by law, life imprisonment. Because you were under 18 when you committed these murders, your life sentence has to be expressed as detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. That is a sentence I shall pass in due course. But I am also required to determine the minimum period you must serve in custody before you are even eligible to be considered for release on parole. Despite your young age, that will be a very long period indeed. You were convicted of these two offences of murder by the jury after a trial. You admitted the killings and had pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The Crown did not accept those pleas. The issue for the jury was whether you were suffering from an abnormality of mental functioning which substantially impaired your responsibility for the killings. The four psychiatrists who gave evidence all agreed that you were and are suffering from autistic spectrum disorder, but that would not in itself have afforded you a defence. Many people of all ages suffer from autism. It would be an unfair and unjustified slur on them to suggest that autism predisposes someone to commit acts of serious violence. The three psychiatrists called on your behalf, Dr Hill, Dr Meesh and Dr Ho, were of the opinion that it was highly probable that you were suffering from a psychotic episode at the time of each killing, experiencing auditory hallucinations commanding you to kill, so that you felt entirely under control of voices telling you what to do. The psychiatrist called on behalf of the Crown, Dr Joseph, disagreed. He doubted the authenticity of the alleged hallucinations. It was his opinion that you were not psychotic at the time of the killings, but were suffering from an emerging psychopathic personality disorder, which did not substantially impair your responsibility for the killings. The jury had to consider all of the evidence, not just the expert evidence. In particular, the jury had to assess the truthfulness of your claim to have been acting under the compulsion of voices you were hearing. The jury rejected your defence of diminished responsibility and it is plain to see that they preferred the evidence of Dr Joseph. It follows, in my judgement, as Dr Joseph suggested, that in committing these murders you were acting out your violent, sadistic fantasies which had been fuelled by your obsession with serial killers. You had immersed yourself in that obsession for several months at least. 
reading about serial killers on the internet and in books, and watching DVDs. From the materials found in your home and on your phone, and from what you told the psychiatrist at various times, it is plain that in carrying out these two murders you were seeking to emulate other serial killers, such as Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Unquote. In this case, there were a number of aggravating factors Justice Spencer outlined three of those. The first was the element of sadism in each murder, demonstrated by the superficial wounds to inflict pain before the brutality displayed when James Fairweather stabbed his victims in the eyes. The second was that James Fairweather had appeared in a youth court for a knife-point robbery offence just three days before he stabbed the vulnerable Jim Atfield 102 times as he slept in Castle Park. The third was the state of public fear and anxiety caused by the murders, and that Nahid Almania was killed in broad daylight. The judge also had to take into account the mitigating factors. These were that mental illness may have lowered Fairweather's culpability, although that was unlikely. He was also aged just 15 years and 7 months at the time of the first murder, and 15 years and 10 months at the time of the second. He also made frank admissions to the police and pleaded guilty to manslaughter, although he probably had no alternative. Mr Justice Spencer QC said, quote, Weighing and balancing all the aggravating and mitigating factors I have identified, and taking into account the additional criminality in count three, possession of the offensive weapon when you were arrested, the appropriate minimum term for each of these murders individually could not have been less than 16 years making an aggregate of 32 years. But that figure has to be reduced for totality. In my judgment, the appropriate minimum term you must serve is 27 years. On count three, there will be no separate penalty. Stand up, please. James Fairweather, for each of these two offences of murder, you will be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. That is the same as a sentence of life imprisonment. You will serve a minimum of 27 years, less of 339 days you have spent on remand. Thereafter, it will be for the parole board to decide when, if ever, you should be released. If you are ever released, you will remain on licence for the rest of your life. Unquote. James Fairweather shrugged his shoulders and mouthed, quote, Don't give a shit. Unquote waving to his parents as he was led to the cells. Outside the court, statements were given by Chief Constable Warren and Julie Finch, Jim Atfield's mother. Julie's statement said that she'd been unable to work following her son's murder. She said, quote, We are grateful for today's verdict and hope now justice has been served that we can begin to move on as a family. On March 29th, 2014, our lives were changed forever when my kind and brave son Jim was brutally killed. He had been through so much already, having fought hard to overcome the effects of brain damage suffered when he was struck by a car. He didn't deserve to die. At the time, we had no idea the killer was so young, a fact that makes my son's death feel all the more cruel and unnecessary. James Fairweather is a monster in our eyes, and we will never be able to forgive him. I would like to thank all the police I have had contact with for all their hard work and sensitivity. I would also like to thank the media, who have supported us during the investigation, keeping Jim's case in the public eye and helping the police with appeals for information. Journalists have shown us great sensitivity throughout the trial. Everyone has been extremely supportive. My family and I now wish to be left alone so we can continue to grieve in private. Unquote. Good afternoon. In June 2014, in the space of three months, Jim Atfield and Nahid al were brutally murdered in Colchester. James Fairweather has been convicted of both of their murders and today has been sentenced to be detained for life to serve a minimum term of 27 years. His actions devastated two families who lost their loved ones in horrific circumstances. No sentence will ever bring Jim and Nahid back and it will not stop their families from grieving every single day. Today, I'd like to pay tribute to Jim and Nahid and thank their families who have been nothing but supportive to my officers and staff throughout the investigation. The brutal and sadistic nature of the killings had a massive impact 
upon the local community, striking fear into residents for a period of 14 months until James Fairweather was arrested and charged. The community of Colchester came together and helped us to bring this killer to justice. Colchester is a strong community. They consistently provided support and information to the investigation and I'm extremely grateful to them. The sentence given to James Fairweather today reflects the distress caused to both Jim and the Heath's family and I also believe it reflects the wider impact on the local community. The community though can rest easy tonight knowing that a dangerous young man will be detained for a very long time to come. Nahid al family also released a statement which read, quote, Nahid was a remarkable and gentle person who was loved for her kind and caring nature. Publicly, Nahid was a quiet and dignified lady who chose to pursue her academic studies in order to work towards her PhD, and whilst in England she made a decision that she would respect her heritage and traditions in the way that she dressed and conducted herself. However, when she was with her family, Nahid was a warm and loving person who enjoyed laughter and the company of her parents, siblings and extended family. Nahid's brother Raid also had been a student at Essex University and battled feelings of guilt that he had not been able to save his sister. He spoke of how his sister was robbed of her right to get married and to be a mother. Her friends and the staff at the University of Essex said that she was, quote, a bright, talented and conscientious member of the university community, unquote. There were questions about whether or not James Fairweather's autism diagnosis would have had any impact on his actions. Dr Sarah Clayton, a specialist clinical psychologist from Autism Anglia, a Colchester-based charity, spoke about the correlation, or lack thereof, between autism and violent crimes. She said, quote, Whilst we cannot comment on the actual trial or the accused in this case, Autism Anglia felt it is important to share some understanding of autism in order to prevent misunderstanding. Autism is a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition characterised by difficulties with social interaction, communication and restricted repetitive behaviour, interests and activities. Such difficulties, together with stigma, misunderstanding and a lack of appropriate services, can lead to social isolation anxiety, depression and other mental health problems. Autism, however, is not a mental health problem. There is often misconception that people on the spectrum cannot empathise, whilst people with autism may struggle to understand, express and respond to their own and others' emotions, this does not mean that they are not empathetic. People on the autistic spectrum, like everyone else, are individuals with their own life experiences. In summary, There is as little chance of someone on the autistic spectrum carrying out a violent crime as someone who does not have autism. In fact, research often shows a reduced risk of crime in people on the autistic spectrum due to their strong sense of what is right and wrong. James Fairweather appealed to have his sentence reduced, claiming it was excessive. It was thrown out. Lord Justice Tracy said, We are not persuaded it was manifestly excessive in an extremely serious case in which an experienced trial judge took much care over the process of sentencing, unquote. James Fairweather has since been dubbed the Colchester Ripper and Britain's youngest serial killer. Despite the defence's argument that Fairweather had diminished culpability in the killings of Jim Atfield and Nahid al the prosecution were able to convince the jury that he was able to form a reasonable judgement of his actions and understood what he was doing was wrong. If he had not been reported by Michelle Sadler on May 26, 2015, he would have killed again. He was knowledgeable about how to get away with murder. He had done it twice before. He was desperate to emulate the actions of the notorious murderers he was obsessed with. His story ended just like his heroes, with him behind bars for a very long time. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've liked what you heard, please leave us a review or some feedback. You can support us by listening to the show, leaving reviews or join us on Patreon. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks' time. Thank you. 
mens rea is the legal principle of criminal intent. It means literally the guilty mind. Join me, Sinead, every fortnight to discuss Ireland and the UK's most heinous crimes and the court cases that followed. Do you want to know more about a kink killing in Dublin in 2012? Or serial killers in Scotland? Whatever your guilty pleasure, you'll find it and all the details with me. Find Mens Rea wherever you get your podcasts.